All right, Squeaks, are you ready? Oh. Hey there, you caught us at a really great time. It's almost spring here at the fort, which means we're going to start getting a lot of different kinds of weather. Rain, thunder, late snow, warm days, cold days, even fog. So to brush up on all the different types of weather there are and how they happen, we're going to play a game. I'm gonna give Squeak some clues and he's gonna try and tell me what sort of weather I'm talking about. And if he gets most of them right, he'll win an amazing prize. You can play along too. All right, you ready? Hello there, everyone, and welcome to the game of Weather Wisdom, What's the Weather? I'm your host, Mr. Brown, and our contestant today is Squeaks, the robot lab rat. Squeaks is seven years old, enjoys science, loves food, and it says here that you're scared of spiders? Is, is that true? Fascinating. Well, there won't be any spiders in today's game, so you can rest easy. What there will be is lots and lots of weather. Let's get to our first question. This type of weather happens mostly in the winter. It happens when tiny particles of water freeze high up in the clouds, stick together, and fall down to Earth as little crystals. And it's really fun to sled in this weather too. Name that weather, Squeaks. That's right, Squeaks. The answer is snow. Now here's Jesse to tell us more. Who's up for a word game? When I say science, what picture comes into your mind? Is it stuff like test tubes and telescopes? Maybe it's computers or microscopes or living things like flowers or frogs. But did you think of anything that looks like art? A lot of science is really beautiful and there might be no better way to study the beauty of nature than by looking at snowflakes. Have you ever taken a close look at snowflakes in the winter when they land on your coat or mitten just before they melt? Each snowflake is a six-pointed work of art, as cool and as individual as the ones you've probably made with paper and scissors. But how does nature make snowflakes? First thing to know is the little six-pointed pieces of ice that you and I call snowflakes are really made up of snow crystals. Scientists use the word snowflake Lake to describe the fluffy white things that fall from the sky, which are actually bunches of snow crystals all stuck together. And the journey of a snow crystal begins in a cloud. Up there, water in the form of gas, called water vapor, freezes around a piece of dust or pollen that's just floating around in the cloud. This forms what's called a seed crystal. And seed crystals can become snow crystals if conditions inside the cloud are just right. As the seed crystal bumps around inside of the cloud, lots of particles that make up water stick to it. The particles that make up water have a very specific shape. They kind of look like the letter V. And when enough of these particles stick together, they form shapes that have six sides called hexagons. And that's your most basic kind of snow crystal. But if there's enough water around, then more water particles will attach at the little points of that six-sided crystal, each becoming an arm or a branch. From there, all kinds of different things can happen. Even though all snowflakes have six sides, they can end up looking totally different from one another. In fact, scientists have names for more than 30 different shapes of snow crystals. Some are big and flat and are called plates. Others look long and narrow, called needles. Still, others are tall and wide, like columns. And then there's probably the most famous shape, called dendrites. They look kind of like stars that have sprouted tree branches. The shape that each snow crystal takes depends on what the conditions were like as it formed in the cloud. Things like temperature and how much water is in the air can make a big difference if you're a snowflake. So, for example, colder temperatures often make flakes with more pointy and fancy arms. While snow crystals that are made in warmer temperatures and air with less water in it tend to be smaller and simpler. Now, you might have heard that no two snowflakes are alike. A lot of them do look really similar to each other, but scientists think that it would be really hard for any two to end up being exactly the same. That's because the conditions in the clouds are always changing. So the flakes that they make are always changing too. Once a snowflake takes shape, its journey has only just begun. After bouncing around in the cloud for a while, it falls to the ground. And as it falls, it keeps changing, depending on the temperature, the amount of water in the air, and other things like wind that it passes through. Since each flake takes a different path all the way to the ground, each one ends up being slightly different. And that's why scientists say that no two snowflakes are exactly the same, but they're all really interesting and beautiful. So now you know how snow crystals are made by nature. Miniature works of art. No scissors required. Okay, Squeaks, here's your next question. This next type of weather can be a little loud and scary. It happens mostly during rainstorms and is caused by the same kind of static electricity that builds up when you rub your socks on carpet. Can you name the weather, Squeaks? 
Here's one more hint. Listen. That's right. Thunder and lightning. You're doing great. Now let's take a quick break for a few words about thunder and lightning. Squeaks, where are you? Squeaks, where are you? Squeaks. Oh, there you are, Squeaks. Oh, it's okay, Squeaks. Thunderstorms can get kind of loud and maybe even a little scary sometimes. But you know what? Sometimes things that are frightening are a little less scary when we understand what causes them. And we can learn what causes things by asking questions. That's why we're so glad that we heard from our friend, four-year-old Eleanor, who asked, why do lightning and thunder happen? I'm sure Squeaks would like to know. Experts called meteorologists study the science of weather, including lightning and thunder. We can use what they've learned to explain what causes these bright flashes of light and the big booms that follow. And you may not know it, but the science of what causes lightning can happen right in your own home. Have you ever walked across a fuzzy carpet and then, when you reach for a doorknob, gotten a little shock? If so, then you you've been part of making a mini lightning bolt. That shock that you felt was caused by the buildup of what's known as a static electrical charge. A static electrical charge is just a little bit of electricity that stays in one place for a little while. Static electricity can build up anytime two things rub together. When you walk across the carpet, your body picks up tiny bits of charge. Then, when you reach for that doorknob, these charges jump into the metal doorknob and zap. Lightning is caused by the same thing, only on a much bigger scale. The kinds of clouds we see in thunderstorms have tiny bits of ice in them, and these little bits of ice bump into each other. They cause an electrical charge to build up inside the cloud. And as this charge keeps building up, it gets stronger. But there are two kinds of electrical charge. We call them positive and negative. Charges that are different from one another will attract or pull toward one another, a lot like magnets. But in our case, the charge in the cloud is negative. The negative charge in the cloud makes some spots on the ground get a positive charge. And when the charge is in the cloud and the charge is on the ground are just right, a bolt of lightning jumps between the cloud and the earth. And meteorologists have discovered that there are different kinds of lightning too. Some lightning goes from one part of a cloud to another. Some jumps from cloud to cloud and some goes between the sky and the ground. But it's all caused by a moving electrical charge. And all lightning is hot, really hot. And that heat is what causes thunder. Thunder starts with the fact that air is made of tiny particles. When these little particles get heated up, they start to move around more quickly. So when the hot lightning bolt suddenly moves through the air, its heat makes the air particles around it all excited. All those particles of suddenly hot air start to move around quickly. They push hard against the cooler air around them. That air then flies away really fast from where the lightning was with a lot of energy. Our ears hear this movement of the air particles as a loud bang or crackle. That's thunder. So now you know. Lightning happens when an electrical charge builds up inside of a cloud and moves to an opposite charge. And thunder happens when the heat from lightning causes the particles that make up air to push away from the lightning bolt. And remember, when you're not sure about something, ask questions. It just might make you feel better. Welcome back. All right. This weather can be sort of spooky and you might see it in an old scary movie. When it's happening, it's sort of like a cloud has formed really close to the ground and it makes it hard to see. Can you name that weather squeaks? <coughs> What's that? Oh, you want to ask all our friends watching to help you figure out the answer? Okay. Can you all out there name that weather? It sounds like they're saying fog squeaks. What do you think? Yeah, you all got it. It's fall. Thanks, everyone. Now here's Jesse to tell us all about it. Have you ever looked outside only to see that the air was thick and gray and you could barely see? Squeaks and I looked out of the fort window this morning and that's exactly what we found. It was such a strange and different thing to see. Normally, we can see a few trees outside and even a road, but today we could barely see the closest tree. It was a little bit spooky and the news put out a warning to be careful when driving on the roads. All of this was because of the gray mist covering everything, and it's called fog. Fog can make it hard to see outside, and walking through it can make you feel a bit damp or cold. When I walk through fog, I always imagine that I'm walking through a big rain cloud. That's right, Squeaks. It seems that way because fog does look a lot like clouds, except really close to the ground. In fact, clouds and fog are made of the same thing. 
tiny droplets of water. From far away, clouds might sometimes look like thick, fluffy pillows or even cotton candy, but really walking through a cloud wouldn't feel fluffy or comfortable at all. You'd get really wet. There's always some water in the air, except it's not a liquid. It's usually a gas, the same type of thing as the air itself which is why we can't see it. We call that type of water, water vapor. But when there's too much water in the air, it condenses or pulls together really close to become a bunch of super tiny droplets of liquid. When this happens high up in the sky, all those little droplets form what we call a cloud. This can happen much closer to the ground too, which is when we call it fog. It just doesn't happen as often. For fog to form, there needs to be a lot of water that's just reached the ground. That's right, just after a rainstorm is the perfect time for fog to happen. There's all that water on the ground, plus there's a lot of water vapor that's still in the air. Next, the water vapor has to get pretty cold very quickly. If the temperature drops, the water vapor in the air starts to collect into those little liquid droplets. You can see this happen in real life if you have some cold water in a glass. Pretty soon, the outside of the glass will be wet, but that water doesn't come from inside the glass, it comes from from the air. The cold glass makes water vapor in the air collect into liquid drops. When this happens in the air outside, the little droplets are so small that they can float through the air and we can see them all spread out and that's fog. It really is just like a cloud on the ground. There are lots of different types of fog and each happens in different places with different amounts of cold air. The most common kind is called radiation fog. This is the kind of fog that sets in overnight when air with a lot of water vapor in it cools down. In the morning, when the sunlight warms the air again, the radiation fog disappears. Good question, Squeaks. Where does the water go when the fog disappears? When the water in the fog starts to heat up, it begins to evaporate or turn back into water vapor and spread out. When the water vapor is spread out again in the air, we can't see it. It's too small for our eyes. But just you wait, Squeaks. I hear it's supposed to get pretty cold tonight and I bet we'll get some more fog. All right, Squeaks. Here's the last question. This weather can also be scary and dangerous. They form when warm and cold air starts spinning around high up in the clouds, and they look like a big spinning funnel of clouds that touches the ground. Name that weather. <laughs> ah, you wanna call a fort friend for help answering this question? Okay, who do you wanna call? Howdy. Gravy the Tardigrade speaking. Wow, you're on What's the Weather? Congratulations. And you want my help answering a question? Well, I'd be much obliged. Great. I'll put the question up on the screen for you. Hmm, a funnel of clouds, eh? Well, I may not be but a simple tardigrade, but I do pride myself on knowing a thing or two about weather. And this here sounds like a rip-roaring tornado. Yahoo! Squeaks, what do you think? Is it a tornado? That's right, it is a tornado. Oh, I'm glad I could help, little partner. I'll see you around. Bye, Grady. Now here's more about tornadoes from Jesse. The weather is a funny thing. One day it can be sunny and warm, perfect day for sunglasses and flip flops, but the next day it can be cold and rainy. Most of the time, the weather doesn't give us anything that we can't handle with maybe some sunscreen or an umbrella or a snow shovel. But sometimes, and in some places, there can be extreme weather, like big thunderstorms or hurricanes or snowstorms. And one of the most powerful kinds of extreme weather out there is a type of a storm that scientists pay close attention to, tornadoes. A tornado is a fast spinning column of air that stretches all the way from a thunderstorm cloud in the sky down to the Earth's surface. Because tornadoes turn and twist as they move, they're sometimes called twisters. They form inside really big thunderstorms when cold, dry air moving from one direction bumps into warm, wet air coming from a different direction. Because the cold air is heavier, it slides down under the warm air and pushes it up really fast. All this fast moving air rushing up and down can create a sort of spinning thunderstorm and it can eventually keep going to form a tornado. And when a tornado forms, it can be one of the most powerful forces in nature. 
Tornado winds are the strongest in the world, even stronger than hurricanes. In some twisters, we know that the wind can blow to almost 500 kilometers an hour, strong enough to lift heavy things like cars and trucks into the air. And they're loud too. People who have seen them or even been in them say they sound like giant roaring trains. But they don't move as fast as a speeding train. Usually tornadoes travel across the land at about 50 kilometers an hour, slower than most cars go. Now weather can be really unpredictable, which means that you just can't predict or know what's going to happen before it happens. And that's especially true for tornadoes. These windy storms can speed up, slow down, change direction, or even stand still and they can last anywhere from a few seconds to as long as an hour. While tornadoes can happen all over the world, they're most common in the United States. About two-thirds of all the tornadoes in the world happen right down the middle of the country, from the Dakotas down to Texas, especially in the late spring and early summer. Because tornadoes are so powerful and so unpredictable, meteorologists spend a lot of time studying them. They want to understand more about exactly how and when tornadoes can form, and hopefully predict when they'll show up. There are even people called storm chasers who follow big storms around the middle of the US hoping to spot one as it turns into a tornado so we can get a better picture of what really happens when a twister forms. Scientists still don't know for sure when a tornado is going to happen, but they have gotten better at predicting which thunderstorms might be strong enough to create one. And if they spot a bad looking storm early enough, then they can give people who live nearby a warning that a twister might be coming. That's one of the most important jobs that a meteorologist has, helping people get ready for extreme weather. So the more they learn about tornadoes, the better we can prepare for them, and the more they can help us understand how our weather works, even when it's not so extreme. Wow, Squeaks, you got all the questions right. You win What's That Weather? And your prize is... all of the great weather science knowledge you learned today. It is an amazing prize, Squeaks. It's amazing because it's a prize you can share with all of your friends. <laughs> ha ha, okay, okay. How about I make you a cheese sandwich too? Would that be a good prize? Thanks for playing with us today. If you wanna keep having fun with me, Squeaks, and all of our friends, hit the subscribe button and we'll see you next time here at the fort.